Howdy folks and welcome to the most entertaining game of World of Tanks I have seen in weeks. Why is it so entertaining, Jingles? Well, it's that tank again. With armour made from hardened stellinium, with an engine that runs on the distilled tears of its enemies, and with a 152mm gun that launches hydrogen bombs guided to the target by the undead hand of Stalin, there has always been and only ever will be one KE-2. There have been many pretenders to the throne of best derp tank in World of Tanks, and yes, Japanese heavies, I'm looking at you. But there's only one original, and it's always going to be the best, and that's the KV-2. Driving the KV-2 for us today is Super Steve, and no, don't worry, he's no relation to the IS-7 driver. He's playing in a top tier, tier 6 match, which is good news for him, and not such good news for his enemies, here on the Arctic map, which is based on the Mannerheim Line series of defensive fortifications that were built in Finland to defend against the Russians during the Winter War. The chap responsible for these fortifications was a bit of an unusual individual, Field Marshal Baron Karl Gustav Emil Mannerheim. Born in Finland, rose to the rank of Lieutenant General in the Russian Army, because at the time, Finland was basically the Grand Duchy of Finland, part of Russia. His father's ancestors were German, hence the name Mannerheim, but his family all spoke Swedish, and they were Finns, so... <laughs> Bit of a mixed up family background, but uh, the man responsible for Finland's victory over Russia during the Winter War and the construction of these defences. And also arguably responsible for the second universal law of ground warfare, the first of which, of course, is never ever ever try to invade Moscow in the winter, and the second one is, don't fuck with the Finns, because they will hand your ass to you. The funny thing about the Mannerheim line defences is that they weren't actually that complicated. We're not talking about a series of fixed fortifications like the Maginot line in France or the Siegfried line in Germany. It was mostly just a line of trenches <laughs> that took advantage of natural terrain features, um, all packed full of very, very angry Finns. <laughs> and so... Uh, there's a bit of a myth has actually sprung up about how impressive these fortifications were, largely because the Soviets were desperate to explain why half a million Red Army troops, 6,000 tanks and nearly 4,000 aircraft could be stopped dead in their tracks for over two months by a handful of Finns hiding behind a bunch of rocks and fallen trees. <laughs> oh, Finland, don't ever change. Seriously, go and look it up and, and read about the Winter War. It's absolutely fascinating and unintentionally hilarious. I mean, the Soviets invaded. They had three times as many troops, 30 times as many aircraft, and 100 times as many tanks as the Finns. The Soviets had thousands and thousands of tanks. The Finns only had 32. <laughs> well, they had 32 at the start. They had a lot more than 32 at the end of the Winter War. They basically captured all the Russian tanks. <laughs> anyway... Oh, speaking of pretenders to the throne, yeah, chew on that one, Tojo. It's that Japanese imposter that thinks he's a KV-2. It's the OI. Yeah, this match in particular, because there's a lot of these Japanese super heavies, uh, there are three OI experimentals on Super Steve's team. There's an OI on the enemy team, although not for very long. Go on, Steve, reload, have him. Yeah, that's what we think of these KV-2 impersonators. We don't like their sort around here. I suppose I have definitely been guilty of promoting the myth of Japanese super heavy tank invincibility in the past, but, well, check this guy out. There's one. There's two. Yep, yeah, he's done. And while Steve reloads and finishes off this jumbo, the thing is, it's not really the tank, it's the person driving it. Although having a good tank helps, and these Japanese tanks, particularly the Tier 5 and the Tier 6, are very, very good tanks. But the thing is, it, it, well, it doesn't really matter how good the tank you're driving is, you still have to be capable of finding your own arse in the dark without the aid of a map, a flashlight, and written instructions. Otherwise, well, 
anybody can make a good tank look bad. And there are a number of them in this battle who make some very, very good tanks look very, very bad, as we're going to see on the post-battle results screen. But for now, however, Super Steve, because he's paying attention to the map, has realised that the base is in serious, serious trouble. They've got one Cromwell up there, who's spotting for the artillery, and he's under fire. And the artillery, I have to say, is one of the superstars of this match. That the fur 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 thing back there, <laughs> and no, I still don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> but it's funnier this way. They've pulled the skulls back. There's only a one tank difference between the two teams now. Well, well, there was. And now everybody that was on that corner down there with Steve, as soon as he's turned around and come back up here, they're all dying one by one. There goes another one. They're now losing 7-10. But hang on a minute. Ooh. Well, the Cromwell's still in one piece. And this is a one-shot kill. There we go. Boom! Headshot! <laughs> That's just what the KV-2 does. The Cromwell's still holding the corner, and with the artillery covering him and shooting at anything that he spots or that tries to shoot up the Cromwell, um, they've done all right there. They've managed to hold the base defence together. Unfortunately, the rest of the team are not having such a good time. Oh, there's a Type 95 down there. He doesn't have the shot, but there's some higher ground over here. If he can get around there and get a shot down into him, He's going to have to be quick though because that T-34 down there is the only thing slowing this Type 95 down and he's taking a real beating. But any second now, and it's probably going to be too late to save the T-34, he's done. But that Type 95 had better bend over, grab his ankles and kiss his ass goodbye because here it comes. Type 95 down, but then a surprise T-25 pops up and he's caught Bert the Avenger in the open. And it's not just the T-25, there are a whole bunch of enemy tanks over there shooting at everything that he's spotted. Bert's down, the Cromwell spots him goes for it but all of those enemy tanks on the far ridge over there are shooting up the Cromwell as well the Cromwell's down but surprise <laughs> and back into cover thank you very much <laughs> I'll be here all week try the fish and don't forget to tip your waitress so funny but there's just the two of these guys left and thankfully for Steve's team these two are awesome. Watch the way these two tanks work together. So, they're outnumbered 5-2, to two, and there are two very decent artillery players on the enemy team. The problem that Super Steve has here is that, well, the KV-2 is pretty much as blind as a bat. It has a very, very bad view range, and it also has a very bad signal range, so he can't afford to wander too far away from the lefer fur 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 Otherwise, any targets that he does spot, like that guy, he's not going to have the radio range to signal his location back to the friendly artillery so he appears on the map. But the Lefer is aiming, even though Steve missed because he snapshotted it off and he takes him out. So, one down, four to go. And there's a near miss from the Griller. And the fact that he's actually able to land a shot in that location indicates where his position is likely to be. He's going to be down there at the bottom of the road on the corner of Fail where Steve first went at the beginning of this match. And all too often in this kind of situation, you see the enemy team with a numbers advantage throw it away by attacking an entrenched KV-2 one at a time. Well, this team don't do that. Credit where credit's due, they're actually pretty smart. And there's a hit from the ELC. Spotted him. Didn't give Steve a chance to fire back. He's pulled back below the line of the hill, which is going to make it difficult for the artillery to hit him as well. And I'm wondering why that griller hasn't fired again. Perhaps he was relocating. Oh, no, there it is. There it is. Yeah, he's still in the same spot down there. Steve checking behind him. He's wondering where that Stug is. But he knows that the ELC is down here. Chances are the ELC is going to see him before he sees the ELC. And he's a very, very difficult target to hit for a 152mm derp gun. Where is that little French bugger? There he is. Steve aims up. Aims up. And no, why did you stop? And there's the hit from the artillery. Steve starts backing up. He's got a 20 second reload on this gun. It's down to the friendly artillery. He's missed. The ELC's still there. And this is when disaster strikes. And there's the Stug. Very well executed attack by the enemy team. Hits him once. Hits him twice. Hits him a third time. Leaves him on five health. Boom! Headshot! <laughs> because that's just what the KV-2 does. But he's on 5 health. Even a near miss from the artillery can kill him here. And where is that 
the ELC still over there. So, oh, he's bounced another shot from the ELC. That's that Stalinwood armor for you. He really doesn't have much of a shot at him. Fires and misses. Come on, artillery. Steve's luck is not going to hold out forever. He's bounced two shots from that ELC, and now he's disappeared. He could be anywhere. So the artillery is going to have to start taking blind shots. And he kills him. <laughs> so, oh, and there's the next shot from the Griller. Obviously firing blind, and not a terrible idea. I mean, the friendly artillery managed to do it to the AMX ELC, and Steve only has five health, and a near miss from high explosive artillery shell would have finished him off. Now, because he was able to land so many shots around Steve's location, he has a pretty good idea of where that Griller artillery player, at least, is, or was. And so, rather than go down and face him and potentially get himself killed and throw the match, he decides to head around the other side of the map. And you'll notice that Dr. Evil in the friendly Lefer Fer 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 is following him at a discreet distance so he can take shots at whatever Steve spots or whatever kills Steve should that situation arise. Now while the KV-2 does have a terrible view range, it's only 330 meters, that guy who hasn't sat still in the same location only has a 310 meter view range. Good night sweet prince. Uh, <laughs> so Steve did get spotted at the last moment, so he's got to keep this thing moving because there is still an artillery remaining on the enemy team and he only has 5 health, but you'll notice that nobody takes a shot at him. Now that tells you something, even if you don't know exactly where the enemy artillery is, if he's not shooting at you while you're spotted, in this kind of situation the, the only reason would be because he's in a position where he's just physically unable to take the shot. So Steve comes to the conclusion that the enemy artillery is still sitting at the base probably in a position where he was shelling all of those friendly tanks down on the corner of Fail, and that's why they call it the corner of Fail, because that stretch of road down in the southeastern end of the map is where heavy tanks go to get shelled and killed by artillery. So Steve sets off to see if his hunch is correct, and he can find the enemy artillery defending his base. And even if he's not there, Steve can start capping and force the issue. It puts the ball firmly in the enemy team's court. They have to do something, they have to react to the fact that they're being capped, otherwise they're going to lose. So, This, unfortunately, is the point at which the really, really bad radio on the KV-2 is going to start making its presence felt, because before too long, Steve is going to be out of radio range of Dr. Evil in the friendly artillery, and unable to relay the position of anything that he spots on the map to Dr. Evil. In fact, well, it's a completely academic question, because now we know exactly where that enemy artillery is. He's capping. It's likely that he was down here, until it was just too late for him to do anything to assist the Griller, the Stug, and the AMX ELC, because there just wasn't enough artillery fire coming in on Steve's position for there to be two artillery shooting at him. So he has moved, probably from this location, and now he's in the cap, and Steve is far too far away. I mean, you can't even see his own friendly artillery. You can see him on the map, but you can't see his location. On the battlefield, he's just too far out of radio range, so Steve is completely unable to do anything to assist here. It's all down to Dr. Evil. The cap counter keeps increasing. And, oh, I don't know if he drove him out of the cap circle or if he hit him, but he's it, one way or another, it's been reset, and Dr. Evil is going to be... Oh, no, he's got a... Dr. Evil, friendly artillery player in the... French Tiff, or artillery, played the game of his life, got six kills, but he's dead. And now it's down to Steve in the KV-2. And he's probably wishing, <laughs> he's, he's probably wishing, instead of trying to come back and do something about this enemy artillery, he's probably wishing he'd actually gone and tried to cap instead, because now this would have been a guaranteed win. Instead, he tried to assist his teammate, too far away to actually be able to do anything when it mattered, and now the enemy artillery is capping again. And the KV-2 is a lot of things, but it's not particularly quick. Can he make it back in time? Super Steve's got two advantages here. One, his gun takes 2.9 seconds to aim, and the artillery's gun takes over 5 seconds to aim. And he knows where the artillery is, and the artillery doesn't know exactly where he is. He could be approaching the cap from any one of three different locations. But if the artillery is facing in the right direction, <laughs> and if he misses, because even if he makes it up here in time to take the shot, he's only going to get one shot. Look at the cap timer. There's 80, 81, 82, 83. <laughs> Come on, Super Steve. Where is the little... There he is! 
He's spotted you. He's not facing the right way. He's got to turn it around. Steve, start aiming. Start aiming. Stalin, guide my shot. Shots out. And yeah, it was never really in any doubt, was it? <laughs> Steve's like, chill, comrades. I totally had this. <laughs> Cap counters at 99 when he lands the killing blow. Yes, I had this all the time. It was never in any doubt. So, Super Steve and the KV-2 with Ace Tanker, Radley Walters, Spartan, Defender, High Caliber, and Top Gun. And a massive, massive shout out to Dr. Evil in the friendly Lefer -fer 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 -fer, who also played a blinder of a game and got six kills. These guys got 13 kills between the two of them. Guys, you should totally have formed a platoon. You would have gotten a crucial contribution as well. Although I appreciate you probably had other things to think about at the time. But speaking of allegedly overpowered tanks, and once again, it just proves it's not really the tank. Although having a good tank helps. It's more to do with the person driving it. Have a look at those Japanese super heavies. <laughs> look at that. The three OI experimentals on Super Steve's team did just over 300 damage between the three of them. <laughs> And the tier 6 on the enemy team didn't even do that. So, yeah. I mean, I can go on and on about how overpowered these tanks are, but at the end of the day, if you're incapable of finding your own ass in the dark without a flashlight, written instructions, and a map, it, it's not the tank. <laughs> it's you, okay. Uh, but it's definitely not Super Steve. You played a fantastic game there. In um, Stalin's Hammer, the KV-2, ably assisted by Dr. Evil in the French Tier 4 Premium Artillery. I hope you guys enjoyed that replay, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.